Well, thank you for joining us today for the Connecticut Historical Society Lunch and Learn, the NeuroColor Line, Locating Black Autism and Black Neurodivergence in the Archives. Our presenter today is Diana R. Pollan. She is an Associate Professor of American Studies and English and an Affiliate Faculty in Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies at Trinity College here in Connecticut. And she co-directs Trinity's Global Health Humanities Gateway Program and coordinates the African American Studies minor. Dr. Pollan has published, taught, and presented extensively on Black autism. And she was a speaker at the Metropolitan Museum of Arts Crypt the Met series. And she's currently working on a book project, Autistic Blackness, and on collaborative interactive digital archive, Locating Blackness. So it's great to have you, Dr. Pollan. Welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm I'm really happy to be here, and uh, I'm going to try and keep my presentation to a limit. So if there are questions, if they're not, I always have more to say. So thank you for coming. And uh, I want to start off by introducing. Thank you for that introduction. I want to thank the Connecticut Historical Society for both inviting me to present, and also for the past two years um, in in um, connection with the Public Humanities Collaborative, uh, inviting me and inviting my students to come in and do some archival research. It's been really rewarding and has led us down some different paths that we did not expect. So I'm going to start um, by talking about the title, The Neuro Color Line, Locating Black Autism and Black Neurodivergence in the Archives. Um, but I'm going to start by telling you a little bit more about myself. Uh, when I was in grad school, my first graduate experience, a friend said to me a long time ago, you live in a contact zone. And we laughed at this concept coined and popularized by Mary Louise Pratt, but it still applies to my life and to many others' lives. Mary Louise Pratt described contact zones as those spaces where cultures meet, clash, and grapple with each other often in context of highly asymmetrical relations of power, such as colonialism, slavery, or their aftermaths as they are lived out in many parts of the world today. So I live in a contact zone. What does that mean? It means I'm a black scholar, a mother, an advocate, an author, an educator, a creator, a parent ally, a collaborative life learner. I have two adult children, who are deemed legal adults, and I say that because the age is 18, but as we all know, uh, you have a lot to learn. Your brain, brain has a lot of developing to do beyond 18. It also means that as a parent, you um, really are, are um, if there are things around medical or developmental issues, um, it becomes more tricky to advocate for your adult child because they become their own agents, and which is both a good thing, they really liked it during the Vietnam War, which is when they changed um, the, the, the uh, legal age of adults to 18 so they could vote and go fight. But it becomes really thorny when you're looking at um, sort of uh, any type of institutionalized or medical, medical practice uh, in which you need to advocate for your child. So my two adult children uh, and I have all experienced the disability industrial complex in and through firsthand experiences. We have navigated distinct yet interrelated sites entrenched in ableism of all kinds, such as schools, medical research institutes, mental health facilities, support groups, hospitals, political and advocacy organizations, family gatherings, and everyday activities at home and in the communities in which we live, work, and play. Although each of us experience these sites differently, although I cannot untangle the ways in which the different arenas I occupy overlap, such as the private and public arena, the professional and personal, I'm taking a moment here to acknowledge my privilege and agency as a parent who is also a full-time employed professor at, a, at an elite private liberal arts institution. At the same time, I also want to highlight the re relationality of my position as a full-time employee outside of the home, as a single Black mother, as a dark-skinned woman who regularly navigates spaces that are predominantly white and more often 
than not predominantly male. For me, collaboration and interdependence have allowed me not only to survive, but thrive in these spaces, these contact zones. In a society that rewards individuality, independence, productivity, and profit, inequality is not only in existence, but also required to sustain the power of those who benefit most from inequalities. However, some of us, and I would argue that many of us, not only by our circumstances, but also by our imagination and creativity, um, are required, are compelled to work with and think with and alongside others um, in terms of our different ways of being and living in the world. These ways of thinking along with, working along with, involve care, interdependence, and inclusivity. Thinking and imagining can be exhausting or even frightening, but for me, there is also a great love that underscores my desire to better understand the present, learn from the past, and imagine a better future. So let's get started. I forgot to start my personal clock and I really wanna make sure. I, so I'm gonna do that right now. Reset, it says one second. I think I've been talking longer than that. Okay, one of the kind of coincidental um, things about this presentation is it literally straddles April and May, which are respectively Autism Awareness Month and Mental Health Awareness Month. May is also Asian American and Pacific Islander um, History Month and Awareness Month, but there are many identities and places um, that we occupy, so those certainly could overlap. Uh, I want to start by talking about the end of my title, an archive. What is an archive? And I'm going to put on my performance studies hat for a minute and talk about Diana Taylor's book, The Archive and the Repertoire, in which she looks at archives and defines archives through a performance studies lens. In her work, she argues that performance in the Americas, ranging from plays to official events to grassroots protest, uh, must be taken seriously as a means of storing and transmitting knowledge, a type of archive. Taylor reveals how the repertoire of embodied memory conveyed in gestures, the spoken word, movement, dance, song, and other performances offer alternate perspective to those derived from the written archive and partic are particularly useful in the reconsideration of historical processes of transnational contact. Embodied memory, this idea that memory is lived, connects to my exploration of autism as it is both embodied, experienced, and represented in and by Black people. And this archival, this archive, this repertoire of knowledge is grounded in history, often hidden in undefined, unidentified history. The archives, as the Connecticut Historical Society demonstrates, and they demonstrated this in, the, in their exhibit on mental health and their current exhibit on early Chinese education, um, their archives are not limited to written documents. Although they also serve as an important receptacle of knowledge, archives also include objects, spaces, land, and the untold stories of the environment in which we live, work, learn, play, and coexist. And as I'm speaking here about land, I also did include in my presentation a reference to the space in which um, Trinity College is located and to remind um, our viewers and um, myself you know, of the layers of history that inform our current understanding as well as occupation of spaces. And these layers of history also inform my study and interest in Black autism. Uh, as many of you may know, Black, the term autism wasn't even really used um, until the 1940s. So other terms that were very generic, like imbecile or feeble-minded, or even an earlier version of autism um, diagnostic criteria was that it was childhood schizophrenia. All of these are terms that medicalized terms that are now um, antiquated, yet those are our places where when you're looking back, when you're looking for 
absences or fissures in the archive, those are places where you look and sometimes find information. There are also places where you see the different ways in which different bodies, communities, geographical locations shape the perceptions of those who are reading or evaluating those images. Now, another, just another performance study scholar whose work I admire um, and I'm borrowing from here is Daphne Brooks' work on, uh, called Bodies in Descent. And it's a work on 19th century performances, but it's a work that looks at unruly bodies. And often disabled bodies are considered unruly, out of control. Often black bodies are considered unruly and out of control. And this has led to some of the anti-black violence, some of the killings um, that we've, we've seen more recently, but also historically. And there's a tension between what archives record and, and those ruptures um, that archives are unable to record. Uh, and it's an interactive experience as well, and thinking sort of performatively, you come to a performance, you bring in information, you bring in your cultural perspective, you bring in your preconceptions, and you read the performance. I would say archival research, whether it's looking at protests, whether it's looking at a particular event, um, a particular formal performance, still um, is about an interactive experience. So when she was talking, when Daphne was talking about 19th century performance, she talked about how African-Americans at that time seized on the potential of unruly performance to articulate heterogeneous identities. These cultural innovators managed their alienation by turning the disorienting condition of marginality and subjected into dense performances that ranged from formal and highly orchestrated concert hall events to literary endeavors and spontaneous quotidian encounters. What we know for sure about archives is that they are always incomplete. And when we encounter the archives, the experience is not one, it is not self-contained. And you sort of think of the archive as in this silo, you know, um, working independently, but it's very interactive and you're bringing so much in, into the archival space with you. Archival research represents an interactive encounter that is informed by our knowledge as well as by our ignorance, by our ability to both locate readily available cultural artifacts and to wrestle with the spaces, silences, and fragments of the past and present that we then filter through our own body-minded positionality. What do I mean by body-minded? Well, I use the term body-minded building on Margaret Price and Sammy Schock's reframing of the critiques of ableism, which often is referred to as um, focusing on the physical bodies, physical bodies and abilities, um, and uh, their desire to bring in mental health and other ways of being in the world to complicate and challenge this distinction between body and mind. So the distinction between ableism that's able-bodied and able-minded and combine them to think about the ways in which minds and bodies are intertwined and often disability is manifest in multiple ways. And I contend that black autism or autistic blackness, which I will talk about in a moment, um, falls into this category in which the neurological and the physical are very much intertwined. Uh, why autistic blackness or black autism? I, I waver between these terms because there's a way in which blackness um, foregrounds a specific identity-based history uh, and also the way some black autists prefer to identify themselves. But there's also a way in which autistic blackness can complicate our understanding or definition of blackness. And again, here I want to situate the term black as a broad term, not a reductive term that really takes into account historical specificity, embodied difference, and also the diversity of black identities. So global, African-American, Caribbean-American, uh, 
Blacks in the Americas, a whole variety of experiences, Afro-Indigenous Black people. So I foreground Blackness as well because of the way in which it's race and not just Blackness is lived as a multivalent way of being in the world. However, there are material realities that shape Black identity based on the category of Black. And just to give some sort of factual information, um, I uh, to just kind of ground this kind of more theoretical, the fact that black and brown people get diagnosed with ASD significantly later than their white counterparts, despite the fact that autism spectrum disability is reported to occur in all racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic groups points to some differences. We also see that despite the most recent CDC report that estimates now that one out of 36 children get diagnosed with ASD, which doesn't include late diagnoses, it, it, it points to the disparity even further um, and what happens and why different people are identified earlier, um, not to mention the difference between children and adults and who has access to early educational interventions. The stigma around disabilities of any kind are grounded in a history of medical experimentation on non-consenting Black bodies, such as the Tuskegee experiments um, and the gynecological procedures forced on enslaved Black women without any kind of anesthesia, as well as medical diagnoses used to incarcerate Black slaves by deeming them mentally ill because they desired freedom. And there was a Dr. Samuel Cartwright who uh, created a diagnostic label called drapetomonia in the 1850s to um, justify the recapture, incarceration, and often crippling of um, Black slaves because they wanted freedom. The fact that Black and Brown people experience disability at higher rates than non Black people with the possible exception of non-Black Indigenous people um, is also another um, piece of this focus. Um, and we have a perfectly current example of that, just looking at the unequal levels of deaths um, related to COVID. COVID. Um, and then finally, but not to complete this list, Black rates of incarceration for women and men are linked to higher rates of undiagnosed disabilities. They often start in school and they're unidentified or misdiagnosed and continue through prison or in other carceral spaces like mental health institutions or restrictive school settings. So I want to take my understanding and also some of my scholarly training in disability studies and Black feminism and Black studies uh, to think about the ways in which um, historical color lines, and here again, I use the term color line to talk about the way in which disability studies and Black studies can, and, and Black feminist studies can think about autism and other neuro, Black neurodivergence relationally. I'll go to my next slide. Oops, go back. Okay. Um, part of the term neural color line comes from W.E.B. Du Bois's study from 1903 on Black life in America. And one of the famous questions he asks in this study is how does it feel to be a problem? And part of that question is linked to his exploration of the way in which recently emancipated black citizens uh, were seen as less than equal, um, but were expected to produce and participate in a way that really um, bolstered the, the nation. He also talked about the line that divided black and white communities after slavery and persisted 
both in the context of the US, but also in the world. And this is a quote from his, his book. Um, he, he, he talks about the color line. He didn't coin the term, actually some earlier writers like Frederick Douglass, uh, a slave who wrote a slave narrative, um, talked about the color line as well. But Du Bois's uh, formulation has been really useful. The problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, the relation of the darker to the lighter races of men in Asia and Africa, in America and the islands of the sea. This color line, I argue, also bleeds into uh, representations and experiences and treatment of neurodivergent, Black neurodivergent people, particularly um, a focus here on autism. As I already mentioned, there's a way in which um, um, Blackness and the, the history of segregation and enslavement carries through the, the sort of medical apartheid that has uh, led to lower, slower diagnosis rates and interventions for people in black and brown communities. What was particularly useful for me also in thinking about Du Bois's perception of a color line that's always present is the way in which it impacts one's psyche. Um, and he uses the term double consciousness to describe this. And I'll quote here, it is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. And again, thinking about autism diagnoses, thinking about the way in which autistic people autistic caregivers um, are, are often um, referred to, um, are, are, are talked about in terms of autism as a burden, um, but also this idea in which you're always aware of the, the ableism or able-bodiedness um, that our culture is, frame, that frames our culture, right? And the way in which you're always looking out and always being looked at and what that means. Um, this idea of, of navigating a world in which you're always outside of the norms, um, but also the way in which your outsiderness or your status outside of the norms is always being evaluated, measured, diagnosed, and um, intervened in different ways. And even as a parent, it's complicated. Being an ally as a parent doesn't necessarily mean that you are um, not also complicit in defining or advocating or speaking for um, someone with a disability. And often, in, even in the organizing efforts, there has been tension between parents um, who advocate for what's best for their children, but who sometimes um, come in conflict with the ways in which um, people with disabilities um, want to be represented or the types of lives that people with disabilities imagine for themselves and the lives that parents imagine for their children. So I borrow from Du Bois's notion of the color line and have talked a little, have referred to the neuro color line. And for me, this term highlights the process through which racism, ableism, and neurotypicality are employed to pathologize, police, incarcerate, and contain black and neurodivergent, um, black and neurodivergent, black neurodivergent, and black autistic body minds. Deemed unruly and dangerous, those who navigate the neural color line must reckon with their own dehumanization and stigmatization that renders them invisible, and vulnerable to mistreatment, ranging from abuse to murder. And the graphic I have here is actually um, from um, an, a, a neurodivergent, Black neurodivergent, um, Black Latina neurodivergent artist um, who, who creates a lot of zines, workshops about self-representation and the history of neurodivergence. So I had asked her to borrow some of her images because they're really quite amazing and really, um, I, I think, offer that sort of layered perspective. Okay. Uh, now I can't find my, okay. So this 
is a slide from a film called Refrigerator Mothers. And I'd like to show this slide because she explains early on in the 70s how her son occupied that neural color line and the way in which he wasn't really diagnosable as autistic because of perceptions of what autism means. So I'm gonna play this quick clip and hopefully you can hear it. When Stephen was not even two years old, I was at the library and the librarian said something about, uh, 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 we have some books here, you, uh, would you like to read something on autism? You know? I said, autism. The little things according to this book seem to identify with Stephen, the rigidity, the repetitiveness, the next time I was at the doctor's office, I asked if he thought Stephen had autism. And it was more than one doctor at that time, it was a team of them over at the University of Illinois. And they said, no, said, uh, it may be an emotion disturbance, but it's not autism. We did not fit the mold. We did not fit the classic mold for autism, which is white, upper middle class, and very, very bright. Jimmy is an autistic child, 11 years old. His father is a specialist in nuclear power plants. Joseph is seven years old. Both of his parents are college graduates. His father is a college professor. It was really not a negotiable issue. According to my doctors, my son could not be autistic. Uh, I was not white, and it was assumed that I was not educated. Therefore, he was labeled emotionally disturbed. Here your child has a disability that you recognize. And they said, no, you can't be that. You can't even be a refrigerator mother. The irony of it all. The irony of it all. And so she really, really, articulates how the color line and really overshadows any neurological or any other evaluation of her son, but how it also extends to this perception of her, her, her blackness, her ability, sort of the ableism. And the refrigerator mother, just to give a quick reference here, is um, what was one of the sexist um, uh, parts of autism diagnoses, that it was because of cold refrigerator mothers who were educated, working outside the home, highly, highly educated because of a, a, a broken bond between the mothers and the children, um, it, their, their children developed autism. So even to wanna be that is kind of, it's ironic, like who wants to be a refrigerator mother, but the fact that because of her race, she was excluded from that category is really telling. When okay, sorry about that. Okay, so I use both the term autism and neurodivergence, but I also want to talk about a term that is often um, circulated as well around neuro neuro differences. Neurodivergence describes minds that diverge from what is considered neurotypical, uh, whereas neurodiversity at least in, from my perspective, describes the very variation of human minds and neurocognitive functioning. We're all neurodiverse. We all think differently, our minds all function differently, but neurodivergence is um, a, a more, um, a distinction that alters the way in which someone operates in the world um, and often, um, either is that person is marginalized or that person receives support um, or in, in some cases that person is um, vulnerable and, and, um, and can end up worst case scenario dead or best case scenario um, um, in a space where there is um, understanding and educational support. So 
The other part about neurodivergence and Black neurodivergence is that it speaks to multiple layers of identity. And it also, for me, it's important to understand why it matters. Why not just neurodivergence? You know, or why not just autism? Why does Black neurodivergence matter? Well, it matters because of the invisibility of Black disability, um, because of the way in which, as as um, uh, the mother in the in the video talked about, her son could not be dis diagnosed. He was deemed emotionally disturbed, and that creates a whole different set of responses and interventions. Um, and it also suggests that there's a lack of cognitive ability, um, both in the parent as well in the ch as in the child. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about Kimberly Crenshaw, but one of the things that she says, and she talks about intersectionality, and in here, obviously, blackness and neurodivergence, blackness in autism are intersectional because they do link together um, different identity, identity categories, but that it's important to understand and see them in order to address the inequalities, to address um, misunderstandings, to address misdiagnoses, to address mistreatment. And she says, if we can't see a problem, we can't fix a problem. And so if you don't see anti-Black violence um, or the dehumanization of disabled people as a problem, that means they've been normalized and they have been normalized in our society because of this hierarchy of ability. Um, and the normalization of anti-Black violence and the dehumanization of the disabled links them both to carceral and colonial practices that date much further back than 2023. They date back to enslavement, they date back to colonial practices, and um, they date back to a history of violence and erasure of, of, of uh, communities and bodies from land and spaces. Um, it also points to a pathologization of different ways of being in the world. And I use that phrase a lot, different ways of being in the world, because of the variety and diversity of neurodivergence, just like blackness, just like autism, neurodivergence is also diverse and is really an umbrella for different ways of interacting with the, in the world, with and in the world. Uh, so as, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not gonna play the clip, but I have it here. Uh, uh, in a talk, Kimberly Crenshaw talks about the urgency of intersectionality. And she bases her term on, a, on her study as a legal scholar, as a Black feminist legal scholar, on the way in which a Black woman who filed a suit against a, um, against a company um, because she felt she was being discriminated against. And they said, well, we hire women. And they had white women who worked there in the front office. And we hire Black people because they had Black men who worked in in the other part, in the sort of machinist part of the factory. And sh she had no place in that because she, she was sort of doubly discriminated against because she was neither a man nor was she white. And she, as I said in the earlier slide, created not only a term, but a visual signal of what an intersection is, to be at the intersection of multiple identities. And often, because of that intersection, some part of one's identity is either overlooked um, or in the in a in a more um, inclusive model, it's in, it's uh, considered as part of who you are. So black neurodivergence and black autisms describes the intersectionality of the experience of, of being black and neurodivergent in a world structured, by ableism and white supremacist foundations. And I just altered uh, Du Bois's claim that the problem of the 20th and 21st centuries are intersectional, yet historically grounded in the color line. So I very much am 
a believer in intersectionality, but I also feel that often the color line is so prevalent and is so historically sedimented that it cuts through intersectionality and still um, often forces that color line. And I will say in another way in which disability echoes the color line is normative and non-normative, able-bodied and disabled, um, neurotypical and neurodivergent. So there are other lines that follow a similar pattern. Uh, oh. Take the entire rest of the time. Um, but I do, I, I mentioned um, to Jennifer that I have a link that she will put in the chat that that has a lot of the, the, the videos and the terms and the text from which I am building um, some of my discussion on which I'm building. Okay. So in a wonderful memoir by Anand Prahad, who is a, a who is a creative writer. He's a filmmaker. He's a musician. He's a Caribbean folklorist. And he's also an example of someone who was diagnosed late in life with autism. And his book is called The Secret Life of a Black Aspie. Uh, and in this book, he coincidentally was born in 1954, the year of uh, Brown v. Board of Education in Virginia and grew up on a plantation, a former plantation. So there are already these layers of his life that are part of the story of um, Black enslavement, Black emancipation, and the neurocolor line, which he talks about in terms of his life growing up on a plantation, but also in a family of neurodivergent people in which it was considered just part of the diversity of their family. But he continually talks about navigating that neuro color line. So I am gonna read this quote, but I put it up here for you to follow along. Being black with autism and especially growing up when I did has meant double troubles. It's meant that often I don't know where one thing ends and the other begins. If I was among a group of white people and didn't understand what was being said, was it because of Asperger's or because of race? Usually it was both. Then I add on, I add on the fact that I grew up on a plantation in a family where almost everyone had neurological disorders. Um, sorry, in some ways though, this combination has helped to save me. Although I was more eccentric than anyone else in my family, I was still familiar. I still made sense to them. They could understand some of my dysfunctions because they had them to a lesser degree themselves. They very patiently taught me simple things about how to get along, how to create a habit and live by it, how to deflect sounds, how to guess what people wanted. Some of those things were what had helped slaves to survive, how to make a mask, how to scream silently. Throughout his memoir, Prahad talks about this multi-layered experience of being Black and being autistic, and also the way in which it's very much tied into a history of survival and masking and code switching, all words that are used um, also um, in discussions of Blackness and trying to navigate um, a predominantly white environment, uh, but also the way in which enslavement and the sort of disabling um, environment and practices of slavery, those scenes of subjection, subjection to quote Sadia Hartman, um, disabled so many communities, but also uh, instilled practices and strategies for survival. A contemporary example of strategies for survival that have failed in another instance is, um, uh, sorry, Elijah McLean. If you don't know about his story, um, he was a young man diagnosed with autism um, who, similar to Trayvon Martin, was walking home. Oops, shoot. Don't. Sorry about that. Go back. Was walking home from uh, a local convenience store 
Um, and someone called 911 and said that he, there was a person in a hoodie who was acting in a way that seemed suspicious. Well, he was a musician. He also was moving and 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 experiencing the world the way in which he experienced it. And to some, that could have been sort of autistic gestures that are artful and aesthetic. To the 911 caller, it was something threatening and unknown. And when the police came, he exercised and practiced the strategies that his mother had taught him to tell people he didn't like being touched and it was uncomfortable for him. And instead they considered that resisting arrest. And the, the, the text is pretty small. So I, I'll read a little bit of what he said, but he said, I can't breathe. I have my ID right here. My name is Elijah McCain. That's my house. I was just going home. I am an introvert. I'm just different. That's all. I'm so sorry. I have no gun. I don't do that stuff. I don't do any fighting. Why are you attacking me? I don't even kill flies. I don't eat meat, but I don't judge people. I don't judge people who do, who do eat meat. Forgive me. All I was trying to do was become better. I will do it. I will do anything. Sacrifice my identity. I'll do it. You all are phenomenal. You are beautiful and I love you. Try to forgive me. I am a mood Gemini. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Ow, that really hurt. You are all very strong. Teamwork makes the dream work. And he goes on. And ultimately, the police um, injected him with a sedating um, narcotic that ended with him dying. And this is all while he's trying to exercise and practice inclusion to articulate what's different about him and apologizing. Um, and this instance, this tragedy, is echoed in many other instances across the country. I mean, I know we also have the, the George Floyd, I can't breathe, and the Eric Garner, I can't breathe. So in that way, the sort of overlap and intersection of black lives, of black male lives, of black neurodivergence are, are intertwined in ways that we can't um, separate, which is again, why the neuro color line is so resilient and present. Um, in Elijah's life that mattered, um, and in many others who have been uh, misinterpreted and killed because of their differences. Uh, in a very recent speech by our current president, Biden, he, I think it was the State of Union, he talked about not having to have that talk with his son and the privilege. And that talk again is about being black and, 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 and being approached by the police or being put under surveillance or being seen as unruly and what you do to navigate a situation when, in which you might be perceived as a threat. Add neurodivergence to that. It becomes, as you saw with Elijah McCain, even more dangerous and you're even more vulnerable. D.H. Hughley, who's actually a comedian, talked about this difference and his fear about his son's future, who is autistic. I also want to point out there's some interesting um, or telling um, perceptions about gender differences when he talks about his daughters, but also there's an underlying ableism because of the way in which there's been this insistence um, or in hyper ability, right? Um, that um, is deeply rooted in the pathologi pathologization and um, devaluing of black lives. When they used to tell me Kyle was defiant, what I recognized a long time ago is that defiance is what gives young black men killed because the, 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 the most uh, young black men who are in prison are, have learning disabilities. They are dyslexic in some way, audio or idio. They, they can't hear or they can't understand their process. 85% of men in prison. So to a, uh, a, a somebody of a different culture, somebody culturally different, that may seem mischievous or he danced to his own beat. <laughs> when it's my, our culture, somebody gets killed. And I knew right away that I would have to 
prepare him for a world that wasn't like the world she wanted for like she was, I she was, was the toddler. and I was like, I, I, I and just, like, get in the game. I can't, I can't, I can't let him do this because it, it will, it will cripple him. It really, it will, it'll be. I could, you could literally get your son killed by not getting him ready for a world that won't see him that way. So I, I think for a long, a lot of his existence, a lot of his growing up. A lot of his growing up. I failed him. I'm like, I'm not getting him right. And I was scared to death that I would, if you fail your son, he dies. He could die. Not my, not my daughters. I knew they'd be all right. But I didn't know how to make him ready for this world and see it there so he could see what's coming. Like everybody tells you, put your hands on the wheel or stay away from this or don't do this. Black boys don't get that kind of hurt, and you know it. So for me, it wasn't about uh, uh, vanity. It was about how do I make this boy ready to, to for a world that, like, if something happens to me tomorrow, I know my son is going to be all right. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, that that really speaks for itself in terms of the layers of sort of parenting a Black young man, although I have to interject that there are Black women with autism, um, and but this idea that culturally certain movements and behaviors are social, are, 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 are perceived as threatening um, and many of those are part of a disability. I mean, his I, his his comparison of being quirky versus being being threatening are really embedded into racialized differences. Uh, when they used to tell me Kyle was defiant, what I recognized a long time ago sorry. is that defiance is what gives young black men killed because the the the. Okay, so. Where do we go? You know, there's a, the, in terms of my thinking as an academic, but also as a parent and also as an advocate, what do we do with the inequalities? How do we address them? And I just recently, actually Friday and Saturday, Sunday, attended an autism awareness event at the state capitol and heard from legislators who all primarily have children with autism. Um, and it was a very diverse group in the different ways that they were navigating their lives, but also their commitment to public, the public arena, that they're working as advocates to not just change the situation for their individual child, but to think and work with others to determine ways to improve conditions and awareness um, in a broader broader arena, which is so important. You get so exhausted in focusing on your own life and your own child, as he said, ability to survive if you're not there, um, that it's sometimes more of a challenge to remember that collective change is going to have much more impact than individual um, improvements. Certainly, we're socialized to work, you know to think individually or even in terms of your family, which is very important. But there, are people in the autism, black autism world, um, who are thinking about different creative ways, different collective ways of educating and sharing um, information. And one of the main ways of doing that is including autistic voices. Right, so these are just some of the sites that I um, gleaned that I put on here. Neuroclastic is a great site where it's a non-binary non black autistic parent um, who was diagnosed late in life. Um, and the conference Autism in Black, which I attended, is um, created and designed by a, a therapist who also a, a woman, a black woman who was uh diagnose autistic. So providing models, but also creating communities and networks. 
Um, it's I just to quickly the last two resources um, are as many of the sites and citations that I or references I made are collected here and where it says Diana Paul and neuro color line resources and then locating black autism. This is a site that is being built collaboratively. I've worked with digital scholars at Trinity with students also interested in black neurodivergence, but it is the beginning of what I want to be both a resource um, uh, of, of historical documents for researchers, of people with practices, of people doing um, um, advocacy work that uh, is both interactive and educational. And um, so that is also available. It's available, I think um, Jen's gonna put it in the chat. Um, and if there aren't questions, I'll show it to you, but I'm gonna stop at this point um, this this textile in front of me is also um, part of a, a collective educating through art, disabled artist, and this was um, created by a autistic young black man um, of taking your way of being in the world and creating works that speak to those differences. And again, hopefully increasing awareness and um, really um, expanding what people's notions are of ability and disability. And that's also within the autism community as well, trying to abolish that high functioning, low functioning, verbal, nonverbal divide, which is still part of the autism um, discourse. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Paul. And that was such a powerful, important conversation, presentation for us. Thank you. I going to open it up for questions. So if anyone wants to put questions in the chat, or if you'd like to unmute yourself, go right ahead. I did put three links in the chat, and I will share all the links when I send out the video recording. Um, so I'll get the, all of them to everyone, but I figured I'd get you started with a few that uh, Dr. Paul had mentioned. Anyone have any questions? Take a look. I stopped. I don't know, Christina, did you change your mind? <laughs> Amanda's raising her hand. Do you want to go ahead and unmute Amanda? Uh, hi, I don't see my video popping on. You can hear me though? Yeah, yes. we can hear you. Hi, good. Um, okay, sorry, I'm getting a message. Hi, <laughs> Diana, thank you so much. This was wonderful. Um, it's always so good to hear you talk about your work. Um, I had a thought and I wonder if you, I wonder if you're thinking about this at all, but um, the way you're using neurodiversity and neurodivergence for me is really linked to structural and material conditions and really like not as linked to identity and to sort of like liberal identity politics in the ways I see it sometimes wielded in like the public sphere. And I'm wondering if that's something that you're also thinking about is that um, identity versus sort of like structural way of being located, located as neurodivergent. And I'm gonna mute because my dogs are barking, but thank you. Thank you. And it's so nice to see you. And yes, I think I, I, it's actually very important to sort of think about the way in which neurodiversity is sort of more aligned with kind of um, multiculturalism, you know, that it can be, as you said, this sort of identity um, based um, model that really can overshadow the conditions, the structural conditions, and the ways in which neurodivergence create is 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 also, I mean, it's also neurodiverse, right? But it it becomes a term for thinking about um, that could or also erase the social condition. So it's actually it's a really really good point, um, and something that I I want to think about more because I um, it's just. Uh, the structural piece and the systemic inequalities that are much bigger than autism and and and, and that are much bigger than one racial inequality uh, are really what give what animate and 
give power to these labels as well as the consequences of occupying that label. So I, I thank you for asking that. And I will continue to think about that and email you with questions. <laughs> uh, Sarah is commenting that Robert Chapman's work explores structure and identity in a way that seems to acknowledge that tension that you're talking about, Amanda. Thank you. Um, Susan uh, commented a wonderful presentation and thank you so much. Um, she was struck by your insights about the relational meanings of being autistic in families and other interpersonal connections. Would you and would welcome more reflections on this for people interested in studying that? Uh, well, I, there's a great book that actually Amanda turned me on to called um, Allies and Obstacles that really talks about the complexity within families of both advocating, but also overriding um, or conflicting with um, disability activism and disability rights. It's the sort of, I mean, the sort of the paternalism that's kind of embedded in that or can be embedded in that. So I remember a movie called Including Samuel um, by Daniel Habib. And one of the things that one of the, the teachers who he's talking to that has a, had a special ed program in his school talked about when he was talking about inclusion in, in elementary school, he said, we have a great model for inclusion. It's families. You know, if there's someone, if a family has a disabled child, they're always thinking about accommodations and thinking about inclusivity. And that could be the case in some families. And also there, it's not, you know, it's not necessarily that a family might not have multiple disabilities, thinking back to um, um, Anand Prahad's example of the way in which the structures of racism and the chronic stresses of racism that are intergenerational disable the entire family, even if it's not a label, right? Or even if it's not diagnosed. And you see that in the unequal levels or the sort of, at this point, epidemic levels of dementia in black women. That's not really discussed or um, heart disease, other physical manifestations of stress and genetic mutation over time, right? So these are all structural and are much larger than a family's individual as an individual unit. And we also know that even the structure of family um, is really is socially constructed in a way that confines rather than opens up, or can be socially constructed in a way that confines rather than opens up networks of support. Hope that helps. Chris, uh, Christina had a question. You can go ahead and unmute Christina. Hi, Diana. Before I was just giving you a, a round of applause emoji, but I did have a question. Um, so I, I just want to thank you so much for uh, sharing this really powerful research um, and really helping, you know, from the classification of drape domania on, uh, you know, helping us rethink the classification of mental illness uh, under structural racism. I, I particularly appreciated um all your attention uh, to the question of policing and just bringing back the question of, or, you know, uh, bringing back the story of Elijah McCain that I, I, you know, think everybody should know about and think about. And um, I, uh, I, I guess I, I was curious to hear you say a little bit more about the question of social regulation through policing, the social regulation of non-normative behavior, uh, the way that it particularly of, uh, you know, how that gets racialized, how that affects policing. And I was just curious if you could um, talk a little bit about how you've seen uh, uh, people respond to, uh, you know, uh, that particular conflation. Uh, if you have any resources for those of us that are interested, I'd be really grateful. But thank you so much for your work. Thank you. I, that's like a presentation and a question. No, <laughs> I was taking notes as fast as possible. And thank you so much. I, I, yes, the Elijah McCain story, I, it just echoes so many other stories about social regulation, particularly of, of young 
well, not just young black men, of women's bodies, um, of, 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 of uh, spaces that in which certain bodies and certain racialized bodies are considered threatening. And I think, uh, I mean, we've seen with so much of the gun violence uh, that ringing on a door, ringing a doorbell, right, can lead to death. Um, when you are perceived that, and you know, are you perceived as threatening just because you're entering the crossing the private public realm? But as we know, the public realm is also being privatized in these racialized ways, right? You're not allowed here, you're not allowed there. And it goes back, I mean, when you mentioned Drapetimonia, to the policing and regulation of bodies and behaviors that were seen as non-compliant, um, right? Around labor, around, um, yeah, the production, the, 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 the forces, the, the, the labor forces that were either conscripted or, 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 um, or enslaved and the need to continually maintain a sense of compliance and that certain behaviors um, even had to be masked or altered in order to be uh, perceived as non-threatening or else they were regulated. And actually one of my students brought up very recently the Central Park Five that one of the young men had a learning disability. Actually, it was the young man who wasn't even there you know, and that his processing and the the sort of interrogation of a underage young black man really escalated the way in which he incriminated himself and similar to Elijah McCain was apologizing and confessing, right? And that ignorance, but also kind of the the structural the way in which social regulation is embedded in from schools through the you know the school to prison pipeline it starts so early right and it starts um with exclusion it starts with reward and punishment you know even if the punishment is gone if the rewards are, are of compliance um are that you get to stay in the classroom right or that you don't get put in a segregated space or that you don't get identified or stamped as um, unruly um, are very much, and I, I think about um, um, the young man in, um, oh my gosh, Tyree, I forgot his last name. I'm hey, yes. How even the, the sort of structural racism extends into regulation regardless of race, right? It's about um, uh, uh, about a, a freedom and an agency that's associated with certain types of bodies, right? Um, so it's, I, I would be interested in, in resources. I, I, one of the presenters at the Autism in Black conference, actually, she used the term white, instead of white supremacy, she used the term white insecurity which I thought was really helpful for thinking about, because white supremacy is reinforcing that social construction, right? Whereas white insecurity is pointing to the need to continually police, regulate, and maintain a, a, a hierarchy based on race and power that isn't natural, right? That has to be continually policed and reproduced. So um <laughs> thank you. We have one last question, Diana. Um, Karen and Sierra, the staff at the CHS and the Research Center, they say hello. Um, they were wondering if you found any evidence in the historical records on this topic. I guess, I think, I guess they would really want to know about that, considering I did some research. And actually, yes, it was it I found it very difficult to, that was a lot of excavational work. And actually I can credit um, some of my students, like Isabel, if she's here, I don't know if she is, but who looked at the terminology for 
identifying exceptional. And again, this is interesting, like what gets saved or what gets documented. It's either a very pathologized and sort of medical model of someone who's severely disabled and closer to the, the sort of um, fully institutionalizable person who has to be completely restrained and contained. Or she actually found a document in which a young woman who was exceptional um, and who was deemed um, uh, still, it's she was black, so there was something exceptional about her abilities, but they were in fact um, similar to a lot of the autists who are savants who are often highlighted. And that is black autists and autists of all colors who have these savant abilities. And again, that kind of falls into the model of exceptionalism, of individualism. But I think with the archives, the terms were so important in terms of where we find evidence of the past. I mean, I, one of the things that was said at the Autism and Black Conference is Black autistic people or Black neurodivergent people were always here. It's the way in which they were left out of the archives, right? Or the way in which they were on a list of property and the, the classification of slaves, whether they were fit or unfit, right? That term. And what does unfit mean? Does it mean, going back to Christina's question, that your non-normative behavior is unfit for the most productive type of labor? Or is it unfit for compliance? Or is unfit because it instigates others to behave in a way that's not um, seen as productive. So I feel like the archives, um, the archival research required a lot of creative thinking about where to look. Um, and also going back to where the ruptures in spaces, you know, um, and what are the ways in which difference was talked about in these documents or even images from the past. Um, but it's a, that's an on, that's a, as Sammy Shock says in her book, the, the conclusion, the not end <laughs> in conclusion that it's still work. It's, there's a lot of work to be done. I could, you could lock me in your archive. And, <laughs> and when I got out, you know, um, but it's, it's, it's something that was talked about and conceptualized differently. The flip side of that is there, there were community-wide and, and white communities, and there were some examples of, of people who were considered neurodivergent who were Black, but they were shackled because they weren't doing their work, right? They weren't sent to, which some white communities, they pulled together money and sent them to the Hartford retreat for, 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 um, to get cured or for some rest. Imagine that they believed in rest and return rather than confinement. So again, it depends on what, it, it, it takes a while to find where those bodies are and if there's like a line or a blip because it's not really a long narrative that I found. And if anyone else has found other places, we looked, we also looked in the medical records and that also was very helpful um, for finding kind of distinctions or patterns Interesting. Yeah, a lot of research more to do. Um, I did. There's one last comment from Sarah. She uh, was bringing it back to Elijah and uh, was noting that self-incrimination seems like a, a hugely relevant thing in that she says it seems to me like such an autistic thing for us to apologize um, and it seems like a safety strategy in a lot of contexts. But, you know, if you're being persecuted by the police, that obviously they're interpreting it negatively. Right, or as a confession, right? Right, absolutely. But it well, is, I remember Toni Morrison said, you know, I mean, that's one of an early coping strategy that we learn, right? To get, you know, I'm sorry. Um, it's also a way of, of, of um, showing your compliance. Um, when you don't have a lot, any power. <laughs> right. Well, thank you so much, Diana. This was a really great conversation. I hope to hear more about your work as you continue. 
uh, your search and your research. Um, and I will certainly, as I mentioned, I will send out um, the links when I send out the YouTube recording. I'll send that to everyone here and to anyone that's registered. Um, so thank you so much again. There's a lot of great thank yous uh, for your presentation and for your work at large in the in the chat um, today. And I just wanted to end today um, with a let you know what else we have coming at the CHS, um, some upcoming programs that we have going on. Um, on a lighter note, uh, we have a, a date night on the 11th that is uh, in conjunction with our exhibition, The Bicycle Game. So you can bring a friend or bring a date, a significant other, and we'll be playing for prizes. Um, that's on site uh, and a fur fee per couple. And then on the 20th, we have a Heritage Roots in Connecticut, uh, a panel discussion um, in honor of the um, Asian American, excuse me, Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And this will discussion will focus on food and love and talk about gardening and what is cultivated and how that connects to the past. And you might even leave with some seeds or recipes. So if you have seeds to share, you can certainly bring those for swapping. And then we are also on the 22nd doing a, a CHS open house. So it's open to the public and you can come explore what different departments at the CHS are doing, uh, have been up to in the last year and visit and chat with staff. Um, so this is something new that we're doing, and we're inviting everyone to come see what the CHS is all about. Uh, and so with that, I will say uh, thank you again for joining us uh, for our Lunch and Loon, and thank you, Dr. Pollan, for a fantastic presentation today. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks. Bye.